Welcome everybody to the very first episode of Ask the Pumper Dude. My name is Jake Chamberlain. I'm with D&J Septic Services here in uh, South Lyon, Michigan. Coming almost live from the Pod Shed recording studio. So, let me give you uh, the uh, less brief introduction. Again, my name is Jake Chamberlain, uh, DNJ Septic Services. Um, we've started this podcast video series uh, to answer all the common questions that we receive uh, surrounding uh, septic uh, systems, uh, the maintenance, the care, uh, what you should be uh, thinking about as a homeowner. Um, and just to uh, bring to you the, you know, the ins and outs, the up and coming, uh, we like to stay on the, the, the cutting edge of what's happening in the industry. So uh, that's what you're going to find here. Um, we're, we're looking forward to uh, connecting with, with other uh, septic contractors around the country um, and uh, bringing some interviews to you. Uh, some different perspectives from different states, um, and uh, most important, answer your questions. So uh, I'll just take this moment right now, I guess, to uh, ask you to ask us some questions. Um, we've uh, we started to collect the most common questions that that we receive from customers, and and we'll start start today by answering some of those, um, but. Anything that's on your mind, anything that you uh, have wondered about septic systems, you may or may not have one at your house. Um, but it, you know, even though septic systems have been around for you know seventy to a hundred years now, um, it's still somewhat of a mystery to a lot of people. Um, it's uh, you know the majority of you know Americans are living on a sewer system and so their their water use you know where everything goes when they flush the toilet isn't uh, necessarily that much of a concern to them you know as long as it gets out of their house down to the street um, it's not their responsibility anymore and it's a little bit different um, when you've got your own on-site uh, sewage disposal system and that's really what it is is uh, um, a mini treatment plant in your backyard, your front yard, on your property, um, and it's your responsibility. And there's there's pros and cons to that, um, but uh, the 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 biggest thing that I think is great about having a septic system is that it is yours. It is your responsibility. It, but it's also uh, you're you're also you're not affected by uh, your neighbors or a contractor down the road making a mistake and affecting an entire neighborhood see you know uh, the whole block of houses out out of service because of a mistake that someone else made um, it's all on you um, in that's that scenario the uh, sewer system if you know somebody disturbs a main down the line, you're going to get shut off most likely or you're going to be backing up in your house. Um, I'm sure you've seen the the stories of basements flooded and and all the nastiness that comes along with that. With a, a septic system, you're your own responsibility. Um, the actions of others aren't, it, it shouldn't affect uh, what's going on in your house. So, uh, a little background on, on who we are. Um, we're calling this Ask the Pumper Dude, but I guess I'm more Pumper Dude Jr. Uh, my father, Keith Chamberlain, uh, is the original Pumper Dude. Um, he got that nickname, and uh, he can correct me if I'm wrong. We'll, 
we'll get him in here one of these days and and have him tell some stories and and some of his uh, his wisdom. But um, he got that name from uh, uh, I believe from an underground uh, utility contractor um, that we've done a lot of work for. We still do. Um, and uh, the guys around there, he became known as the the pumper dude, coming in with the with the little pump truck and, and pumping the tanks out so they could uh, tie homes into the into the uh, municipal sewer. So, but uh, yeah, we we are located in South Line, Michigan. Um, my dad purchased the company in 1999, uh, so we're over the 20 year mark now. Um, he basically built the company from from almost zero. Um, the uh, the entire business has been uh, built on word of mouth. Uh, the uh, the entire goal is to provide superior service quality uh, to our customers and uh, create customers for life and. Uh, customers that will talk to their neighbors and their friends and their family and and let them know that DNJ Septic is the only uh, septic company that that they'll ever use, and um, that's kept us around. And uh, we still do business the, the same way. Um, that's my tagline that I've I've brought to the company is, you know, doing the right thing is always the right thing to do. And it doesn't. It, we're not. We're not built on, on making money. We're built on doing the right thing for our customers. We're built on doing the right thing for our employees. Um, if the right thing to do is to not pump that tank because it doesn't need to be cleaned, I want our employees to know that we're not. We're not making decisions based on trying to make as much money as we can. Yeah, we need to make money to stay in business. We need to make money so that we can uh, continue to provide for our employees, our drivers, our staff. They can provide for their families. We can stay in business to be able to, to continue to offer this high quality service to uh, the communities that we serve. But it's not the most important thing. Um, and I might go off on a tangent. This might happen once or twice, but. Um, there's a a uh, author uh, Simon Sinek, and uh, his latest book that he wrote is called The Infinite Game. And I love the idea behind this book. Um, it's it, it part of it. Get back to what I was just just talking about. The Infinite Game is a any scenario that you find yourself in where the rules may change, uh, the people may change, but the game keeps going on forever. And the whole goal for yourself is to stay in the game, to be able to make as much impact as you can over the course of your life. So that's just, uh, it, I think it really resonated with me because it really, uh, kind of defines exactly how we run our, our company. Yeah, we need to make money to stay in the game, but what we're really trying to do is make an impact. We're trying to create a culture of excellent service. Um, something that our customers can depend on and they, they'll, they know we're there. They know that no matter what, we're going to do what's in the best interests of them, and we're going to be honest, straight up people. Uh, we're going to tell it to you the way it is, and we're going to do anything we can uh, to help you through any difficult situation that you might be in, um, and uh, hopefully, ideally, uh, be a service to you to help your septic system last as long as possible. So those. Those are our goals. It's kind of a little background on who we are. I'm sure I'll um, scratch more of that as we go. But the bottom line is 
every, all the information I'm going to give to you today or in any of these episodes are going to be um, from experience in doing the right things. There are so many, uh, there, there's so many companies and people in the world who are willing to cut corners for a lot of different reasons. But we've been very, very consistent on the way that we've done things. Um, doesn't mean we can't do them better. Doesn't mean that we haven't learned things over the years. We sh certainly have. And there's, there's things that, that we'll go get into in the future that illustrates that. But the point is, it all starts and finishes with doing the right thing for our customers and so we've come a lot across a lot of ideas tips tricks um, and information frankly to share and so I'm here to try and do that uh, for you guys in the in this series so I hope it I hope that it provides value to you I hope that it's informative and uh, and again Please contact us with, with any questions that you have. Um, I'll, I'll get links in the description um, for places that you can contact or you know you can email us. You can message us through um, any of our social media platforms. Um, you can give us a, our office a call and say, hey, I got a question for the for the podcast. Can can you uh, send that over to Jake and we'll get an answer for you. So that's our goal and. Uh, uh, without uh, any further ado, um, I've got a I've got a list of some of the questions um, to kind of kick us off here on this series. So we'll see how many we get through here. Um, but uh, I thought this first one was perfect for for this time of year. We're um, still in the the dead of winter. Uh, it's February twenty fifth today. Um, 2020 and uh, we had, you know this is like the perfect Michigan week here that we're having because uh, you know we always say in Michigan if you if you uh, if you want the weather to change just wait a while because we had snowfall oh, I think it was maybe eight or ten ten days ago we had a few inches of snow so everything was covered in snow again and then Within the next week, we hit the the lower 50s, and uh, we I think the last three days or so we've been at least 40 40 degrees or higher, and we've lost all the snow. But wait, <laughs> just wait one more day. Tomorrow we got another snow snowstorm coming. They're talking, I don't know, anywhere from three to 18 inches of snow. But the first question is, can the septic tank be pumped in the winter and the quick and easy answer is yes um, in any of the cold weather states um, anybody that we talk to across the country um, it's always the same scenario as soon as as soon as the the temperature drops we start getting into the winter months um, the phone stops ringing and I personally think that um, it is because people think that we don't work in the winter time. Um, it is so funny. I, it's, it's really the 40 degree mark. That 40 degrees, it goes below 40, the phone doesn't ring. The next day, the, those temperatures clip up just a little bit, 42, 43 degrees, the, the phone rings. So I, I think it's just, uh, you know, people... It's just they either don't think about it when it gets cold, they're thinking about other things, or the uh, they just think that we don't work um, in the winter. We do. And we do a lot of things to try and keep our drivers going. Um, we hate having to lay drivers off. Some winters we end up having to, some we're able to, to keep on going through, through the winter, stay busy enough that we can keep everybody going. But... Um, a few things that you want to think about in the winter time. Um, yes, we can clean the tanks in the winter, but um, 
it is slightly there, there's some other some things that you want to think about um, to be helpful in, in the winter time uh, number one uh, if we, we've had we've had this happen before where um, homeowners trying to be helpful um, they they know the the location of where the tank is um, in the yard and you know we got six eight twelve inches of snow on the ground um, they go out the night before shovel off the area make it all nice and neat so um, we can get right to the tank we don't got to deal with the snow but we come out the next morning go to start digging up the lids it's it's hard as a rock the snow acts as an ins insulator so as long as there's good fluffy snow on top of the ground um, it'll actually keep the ground from freezing all winter long um, the only time we really get in any problems is when we lose that snow and so um, when that homeowner cleared all that snow away from the from the ground um, overnight it was cold it froze the ground solid I don't know how many inches of frost drove right into the ground um, we couldn't even couldn't access it and we had we told all right put the snow all back on there we'll come back in a, a week or two and uh, uh, we'll be able to get at it so don't worry about the snow leave it um, your pumper will be able to will be able to clear it out of the way it, it actually um, if the if the tank is within you know, 12 inches or less of the surface um, we'll actually start seeing some snow melt uh, and it can make it easier for us to locate the tank um, when we can see where the snow is melted in, in one area and sometimes and if your if your tank is is real shallow you you know this because you've seen it every winter the the snow will completely completely melt and that's just because of the the warm water the you know the constant flow of water coming in from the house um, it just creates enough uh, residual heat into the ground there it melts the snow and and we love when we when we <laughs> we love when we pull up and see this perfect rectangle of <laughs> no snow in the yard number one we know right where the tanks at but we like it even more because we know it's not going to be that deep in the ground it's going to be an easy dig so that's that's number one don't clear the snow away um, another thing that 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 you want to think about um, snow is a great insulator but if it gets packed down it'll actually work against us so you want to be mindful of where your tank is located um, especially um, we've seen it where um, a homeowner has a dog and they just run the same track all the time you know and they and they just pack that snow down on this this path constantly and we've run into it where it just so happens that that path is going right over the top of one of the lids and the rest of the tank is soft no problem we can we can access that but where that path was packed down that snow was 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 uh, packed down nice and tight it drove the frost into the ground and we couldn't could not get through that frozen ground you know um, certainly not digging by hand so um, be mindful if there's somewhere that you walk often or you've got a got an animal that's that's constantly walking the same path um, if it's over the top of the septic tank you might want to find a way to um, reroute that path if you can put something that's kind of blocking it if it's a dog it makes them walk around the the septic tank um, just to make sure that we're able to get get access um, other things to think about um, kind of common sense but um, sometimes people don't think about it um, our, our trucks are are not made for driving in the snow um, and we can run into to issues with uh, driveways uh, especially if it's a um, dirt driveway uh, in the you know the, the snow just gets packed down on it and even when it's being you know uh, being plowed sometimes you have that that packed snow underneath um, it can be really difficult for our trucks to get up even it, it doesn't take much of an incline for it to to make that an issue and for whatever reason the you know the 
the truck's being top heavy or whatever it is, when we start sliding, it's, it's, it doesn't usually end up being just a nice slide forward. We start sliding off the side. And once we get off the side of the, of the driveway, you know, it, it can become a, a big issue. It might sink in the ground there. And um, we certainly don't want to deal with it. You don't want to deal with the mess of, you know, we've sunk in the, the ground next to the driveway. So if we just had a snow, Make sure that you get the driveway cleared. Um, if it's possible, to throw some salt down. That it, that will help make make the job so much smoother for us. We can get in, we can get your tank cleaned, we can get out without making a mess, without having any any problems, no hassle. Um, just just a, something that you can think about, um, just to to make our lives a little bit easier. So again, tanks can be pumped in the winter. Um, we just got to do a little extra thinking in, in some aspects, but outside of some of those items, um, your septic system is operating just the same any time of year. Um, once we get access to the tank, um, the cleaning process is, is exactly the same. Um, one thing we might ask is that um, and the, and we'll run into this in the winter where the outside water spigots are um, turned off and pre prevent freezing. Um, if we can coordinate that together where you can have that turned on, um, we can get our garden hose hooked up and help us get cleaned up when we're done. Um, that's certainly helpful. Um, it's not the end of the world. We've got techniques we can do to um, make sure we're getting the tanks cleaned properly and uh, um, keep from, from making a mess. But um, outside of that, everything else is, is pretty much identical. So the tanks can be pumped in the winter. You can call, please call. We would love, we would love, we would love your work any time of year where we ex it really appreciate it in the winter time to help keep our, keep our employees busy. So here's a good question. Um, will the septic tank smell in the house? Um, this is a concern we hear every once in a while. Um, no, you should not get a smell from your septic in the house. Um, so if you're familiar with, with, with plumbing, or even if you're not, you look underneath your sinks, um, you're gonna find what's called a, a P-trap. Okay, so you've got um, the drain from a sink, let's say, and, and this any drain that you have in your house should have a trap below it. They're all basically going to be the same. You've got the drain from uh, the top. It's going to, the pipe is going to come down and it's going to curve up here and then it's going to go out this way. All right. So what, what that causes to happen is that it's going to hold some water in the bottom of that trap. So call the trap because it traps the water. And what that, what that water does is it stops any of the gases because all, all the all the plumbing, all the pipes in your house, everything's going to be connected to um, the septic tank. But they're also connected to uh, vent pipes going out through your roof. So if you go outside and you see on your roof, you've got these little pipes sticking up. Um, those are vent stacks that allow any of the gases, whether, you, if, whether you're on a sewer or septic system, you're going to have um, those uh, sewer or septic gases existing in your plumbing and they're allowed to escape through the roof. Those traps, that water in there, stops the gases from coming into your house up through any of those drains. So we'll quite often um, get calls that it's there's a septic smell, there's a smell in our, in our house, there's a smell. Um, and uh, Usually that's going to be caused from a, a drain somewhere that doesn't get used often. So um, floor drains are, are notorious. Um, if you have like a, a guest bathroom and a shower drain, um, you, you know, if it, if it never gets used, what will happen is that water that's sitting in that trap uh, will start to evaporate. And all it just takes enough evaporation to create an air gap in the top of that where that water should be sitting in that trap and those gases will be able to 
sneak by and, and you'll get a whiff of that in the house. So it's a simple fix. You just pour some water down. Um, the floor, floor drains, take a bucket of water, dump it down. It doesn't, it doesn't take a whole, a whole lot of water. I mean, it can't hold more than, I don't know, six, eight, ten ounces, something like that, um, in the trap itself. Um, obviously, depending on what, what size plumbing it is, what size pipe it is, but um, just pour some water in there. That should take care of it. I mean, it's not going to instantly, and the gases exist, it takes some time for that to, to disperse. But if you throw some water down and, um, you know, those odors go away in the next hour or two, you, sh you should be uh, fairly certain that you've, you've taken care of the issue. Um, just a, a tip on looking for where uh, that odor might be coming from. Uh, if you have a basement, you know, a lot of times there might have been a floor drain somewhere that got covered up by carpet. Um, we've had, we've had customers where they just can't find where that odor is coming from. It's, it's there and they smell it. They've run water in all the fixtures and it turns out someone had carpeted over the top of a floor drain and over the years no, no water's ever gone down that drain and evaporated enough and the gases were getting by. So sometimes you got to do a little bit of investigative work to find where where the source of those odors are. But it's usually as simple as that. Um, sometimes it's it's rare, but if, if, a, if a toilet got, got knocked sideways and the seal got broke underneath, um, it's possible that you could be getting an odor there. Um, but most of the time you're going to get some, some water leaking in that, that scenario too. Uh, but we have seen that where um, we pull the toilet, put a new wax ring on it, set it, took care of it. Um, but, uh, but like I said, mo most of the time you're, gonna, you're, you're getting that from a, a, a trap that, that's dried up some and it's allowing those gases to come by. So that's, unique, that's the easy fix. Um, what do we have here? This kind of this kind of goes along the same uh, wavelength when you're thinking about your plumbing. Uh, this question was: uh, Can the septic tank be uphill from the house? And the answer is yes. Um, it's not typical, but what is typical? What this question made me think of is: There are a lot of times where you've got a bathroom. In the basement, a lot of you know, especially the finished basement, you may have a bathroom, you may have laundry, um, and a lot of times, if it's uh, if it's not a walkout basement, you got to get that water to go up to the first story so that it can gravity flow out to the to the septic tank. Um, and what you'll find is that a, a basement ejector pump was installed. So this looks just about identical to a sump pump. But you'll have, you know, it's usually going to be located in a uh, utility room or, a, you know, a boiler room, your, you know, your, where your furnace is located. You, you typically, typically going to be in, in that same general area. And, you know, the bathroom, uh, laundry, what, you know, whatever's coming to it is going to call, come into this basin that's down in, in the ground um, of the basement. And there's a pump inside, and it'll actually grind up all the solids and it pushes it up um, there's a check valve so when it sh pumps it away shuts off it stops it all from running back because there's it, it's, it's usually going to be a you know 8 to 12 foot push vertically and then it, it just pushes it up into um, your your plumbing at ground level and then it can gravity flow from there out to the septic tank so you're not typically going to find where the the septic, septic tank is above the house completely. I've never come across it personally, but the, the only thing I can think of is is a possibility that you got an old, you know, real old house that didn't, you know, before before septic systems were installed, and it's down in some low area, and the, the, you just could get a septic tank down to it. Um, what what could be installed uh, would be something similar to what is used for uh, a municipal sewer system that is uh, not gravity fed it's it's pumped up to it so 
there's a uh, big crock outside the house um, with the pump down inside and so all of the house would still flow by gravity out to this crock uh, usually holds about 70 gallons of water it's got a grinder pump in it and um, that pump um, would probably that would get pumped up to a septic tank up top and then flow out gravity from there um, to a drain filled so that that would be very rare it would be a cool situation to come across um, but um, typically tanks going to be just below ground level so everything can gravity flow from there but you'll find that the uh, the basement's getting pumped up to that to that ground level um, it's always a good idea with those uh, basement ejector pumps uh, it it always seems that you're gonna have a problem with those only when you've got guests over and they're using that facility a lot of times we'll see you know it's just a guest bedroom or it's you know it's a they use it as an office and there's a bathroom down there or something like that and um, they'll have guests over and they haven't used that pump in, in who knows how long and now all of a sudden they they've got they've got family or friends over staying for the weekend and um, somebody takes a shower or flushes the toilet and it starts flowing back in the bathroom on them use your facilities um, even if it's just going down and, and flushing the toilet a few times it doesn't I mean it doesn't have to be a daily thing but once a week once every other week or so just flush the toilet a few times and to, you know enough to make the the pump kick on and let it run through its cycle um, it it's a mechanical item it's meant to be used so if it if it's never used well, number one it may just fail because of old age and not being used um, number two at least you'll know before you're in that situation where you've got people over in your house and and you're scrambling because the plumbing's backing up on them you don't, nobody wants to deal with that so at least you'll know if you have a problem and you can you can take care of that um, as long as it's set up properly it's not a huge deal to replace um, there's usually not any wiring or anything that takes that, that takes place so that it just gets plugged into the wall um, it's got a little float on the side of the switch that as the water fills up in that that little um, crock it tells the pump to kick on and it'll pump away as the water level goes down when it's pumping and it tells it to shut off um, so but that's that's always a good idea just just use it at least make sure it's working that way it doesn't become a surprise for you um, down the road So what to do when the septic tank alarm goes off? So this won't be applicable to, to everyone, but uh, most engineered septic systems are going to have a uh, pump component to the system. And just uh, the real basic view of it, you've got a house, drains into a septic tank, septic tank drains into a pump chamber, there's a pump in the pump chamber that pumps up to the drain field there's there's several reasons or variables why it would need to be pumped up um, but to keep it simple whatever the reason is the septic tanks ended up having to be lower in the ground than the drain field so it couldn't gravity flow from the septic tank to the drain field it had to be pumped up to get into the drain field so you come home or um, you wake up in the middle of the night to an alarm going off it should uh, the, the, you should have an alarm box um, typically it'll either be found on the outside of your house near the septic uh, tank and pump chamber uh, or it could be located in the garage or in the basement um, when it's inside it's usually going to be located near the uh, breaker box uh, in your house there's several variations to it, but um, you basically you're going to have a red light on there. 
Um, and so if that red light comes on, that's the alarm going off. It should also have a buzzer, so you can hear a meh. You know, it's it's going to tell you that there's an issue. What does that mean? Um, the way that the pump chamber is set up, there's going to be float switches. Um, so they're basically little balls that are uh, attached in some way inside the pump chamber. You've got the pump. You're going to have a float switch here that tells the pump to turn on or on or off, depending on the the water level in that in the pump chamber. And above that on-off float switch, you're going to have another float switch that's connected to that alarm box. And so, if for, for any number of reasons the pump doesn't turn on, and that water continues to raise in the pump chamber up to that alarm float switch, it's going to turn that alarm float switch to the on position, it's going to trigger that alarm to go off. And so what that means to you in the house is really slow down, almost stop your water use, um, your system should be designed that there is some capacity left, but it's usually going to be oh, it's somewhere in the two to six hundred gallon range. Um, once you use that, you're either going to be running uh, water out onto the ground in your yard, or it's going to start backing up in the house. Um, so the alarm goes off. Stop the water. Um, the first thing that you want to check is go to your uh, uh, breaker panel and check and make sure you don't have a either a switch turned off for or, you know breaker turned off that's going to the the pump or that it's tripped and it should be labeled it'll typically be labeled septic pump um, a lot of the times you might see somebody label uh, something as pump um, a lot of times that'll be your well pump uh, if it just says pump. It, it's not, you know, don't, don't take it for gospel, but that's usually, usually what you'll see. If you, if you see that it's a double breaker, so it's a two, two, uh, 224 volt breaker, that's usually, unless it's a rare situation, that's usually going to be your, your well pump, not your septic pump. So if you're looking at it, you got two things labeled pump, and one of them is a double breaker, one of them is a single. Uh, the single is usually going to be your um, your septic pump. So what's this going to tell you? Well, first of all, if it if it's completely off, kick it on, wait a little while, and see if that alarm goes off. If that's the case, um, it's possible someone made a mistake or accidentally turned that breaker off and so there was no power going to the pump and so it didn't turn on so the alarm kicked on and alerted you. You turned it on, now it has power, now it's back to working order. You fixed the problem. Uh, that's rare but it, it's, it's happened. I, um, it always makes me think of uh, a time that we, we got a call, uh, the customer said that the alarm's going off so okay, when we come out, um, most pump chambers have a riser, which is a lid that you know brings the brings the lid up to the surface, so you can have easy access for this situation. Not this time; it was buried, you know. So it was like two feet down, dug all the way down, um, I pulled the lid. You know, water was right up to the top. Okay, I look over. There's a switch. I turned that switch on, the water started going down in the tank. Every once in a while you'll see where somebody installed a, an on-off switch out by, somewhere by the tank. I've seen them installed on the side of the house as well. Um, it's out of the ordinary, but, um, but I've seen it. And she turn it on, problem's fixed. So every once in a while you get lucky at something simple like that. More than likely, you, you, you're going to either find that the switch is on or you're going to find that it's the, the, breaker, uh, the breaker is on or you're going to see that the breaker is tripped. Um, you always give it a try, reset the breaker, turn it on. Um, if it immediately trips again, uh, that's usually a sign that the, uh, the pump itself 
has failed and is going to need replacement. If that breaker is still on and it never tripped, uh, it still could be a failed pump, but the, that leaves open the possibility that it's just a float switch, that on-off float switch. So you remember when the, the water raises in the pump chamber, there's a first float switch that tells it to turn on, then it pumps down and tells it to turn off. That, that switch itself can go bad, and if that's the case, it might flip up like normal, uh, but it doesn't tell, you know, it doesn't, doesn't complete the circuit, doesn't bring, allow the power to get to the pump, and it, the water keeps raising and the alarm goes off. So it's possible that it's just the, the float switch. Uh, we'll do some some more deeper troubleshooting on uh, uh, when the septic alarm is going off in a future episode. Um, but anybody, no matter what type of engineered system you have or what type of pump system you have, that's always going to be the first thing that you want to check are those those breakers. You may have a control panel for your system. There may be some breakers in there as well. Um, you can check for the same uh, scenario in there uh, and, and see if that if that helps you. If you go through all those steps and you still got the alarm going off, um, that's the point where you want to go ahead and call up your septic contractor, let them know you got got an alarm going off. You know what you'll want to let them know is how much water have you used since that alarm started going off. Um, that'll give us an idea for how much of an emergency situation it is. Um, if the alarm just started going off, you haven't used much water, we can usually assume that you're going to at least have several hundred gallons of capacity before it's a, um, an issue with uh, backing up in the house. If, if you're like, oh, no, we just did a bunch of laundry and we, the alarm started going off, so we did a bunch of stuff just to try and get by. Well, that, we know it's, that tank's probably going to be filled right up. We're going to tell you, don't use any water. We need to get out there as soon as, as possible to um, get it diagnosed. So, but at that point, you'll want to have a contractor come out, take a look, and uh, go through some, some more troubleshooting to pinpoint whether it's uh, the, the pump has failed, the uh, float switch is the problem. Uh, sometimes you get into issues in a control panel itself that, that controls the pump. So um, that's the alarm situation. We got one more question here, and uh, this is a good. One. This is this is a um, very very common question. Um, seems like it would be a simple answer, but there's a lot of variables that go into it. So this question is, uh, how often do I need to pump my septic tank? Um, and that's, that's like the loaded question, right? It's, you know, everybody wants to know, you know, I, you know, you get, you get a lot of different answers when you ask a lot of different people. Um, we keep it real, real simple. Um, it all boils down to the amount of solids that are in the tank. Septic tanks should be clean when they're at about 20 to 25 percent water. Uh, I'm sorry, back that up. 20 to 25 percent solids. What that means is a conventional septic tank, let's call it a, a thousand gallon tank, is going to hold five feet of water. So the water in the tank is going to consistently be uh, five feet deep. So we, we have a tool called a sludge judge that we use, um, and it basically it takes a core sample of the, you know a cross section of the of the tank. So we dip it in, take it down, and it's got a stopper. We pull it out, and it's going to show us. Okay, so there's this much solid on top. There's clear water in the middle, and there's this much solids or sludge in the bottom. And so we add up the amount of solids and so let's say there's six inches on top six inches on the bottom so that's a foot of solids you know one foot out of the total five foot capacity tells us that there's 20 percent solids in the tank so that tells us the tank is due for a cleaning and so that's what we do when we come out 
Uh, we're we're going to take a look at um, how much solids are in the tank, and then we're going to ask some questions. You know, how how many people are in the house? Uh, when was the last time the tank was cleaned? Um, did we clean it last time? That's an important question that we ask because there there's there's lots lots of companies that'll come out and service tank, and they don't clean it all the way to the bottom. They're going to say lots of funny things like you need to leave some sludge at the bottom to keep the bacteria growing or um, all these wives tale, old wives tales that they keep perpetuating and I think we're getting to a point where most people know the, the truth that those solids are not meant to stay in the tank. The reason we pump the tank is to remove the solids. Uh, but uh, so that's 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 what's important for us to to look at. Did we clean it last time? Because if we cleaned it, we know that it was cleaned properly. It's going to be a different variable if if someone else cleaned it and left a foot of sludge in the bottom. They left that tank at twenty percent solids, and we come out and we see, oh, this is at sixty percent solids, way overdue. And um, you just had this cleaned two years ago, and that's going to make us scratch our head a little bit. So what do we do in that, that situation? Because usually we can say, okay, it's been three years. You're right at 20%. Um, this is perfect timing. Uh, as long as all your conditions in the house stay the same going forward, we should be able to say, yeah, three years is perfect. We'll, we'll schedule, schedule you your next service for three years out. But if we don't know the answer to some of those questions or there's something iffy about how it's all adding up, um, we basically go by these average guidelines. Okay, so in our area, the, the typical tank sizes are 1,000 gallon tanks and 1,500 gallon tanks. Sometimes a series of both of those, but um, make it simple, a 1,000 gallon tank. If you've got three people or less in the house, you're usually looking at um, two to three years cleaning period. Uh, you go you go above that, you get to four people in the house, you want to be cleaning that at least every two years. You get to five people or more, you're going to be looking at cleaning that tank once a year. The reason that we use that 20 to 25 percent guideline, when we get beyond that, we get 30, 40, 50, 60 percent solids in the tank, it becomes, becomes a lot easier to push those solids out to the drain field. So, I want to mention that so you understand where we come up with those numbers. Um, so, 1,000 gallon tank, you're usually in the two to three year mark for a typical size family. Um, 1,500 gallon tank, uh, we've got a little bit more capacity, um, so we can usually stretch those numbers out a little bit. So, usually on average, we're looking at around the three year mark for, say, a family of four or five on the 1,500 gallon tank. Um, if you got just two of you in the house, sometimes three, you you might be able to get out to that four-year, maybe five-year mark. Um, but that's why it's really important um, and why we believe so strongly in using that sludge judge, so we know. Um, especially once we you know we, we have a benchmark, we've cleaned the tank this time. Next time we come out, we're gonna know exactly where it's at. We know it's been three years. You're at twenty. 25 percent we that now now we can we, we've got a definite answer you're 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 on a three-year schedule do it every three years um, and you're gonna be taking good good uh, good care of your system so 1500 gallon tank is generally going to be around the the three-year mark heavier water use in either you know any size tank if, if you tend to, to use a lot of water especially all at once um, that's, I, I, I usually call it, you know, there's two sides of the coin. Either you want to spread out and space out how you use that water. Don't use it all at once. Use it throughout the day. You give it little, little doses and, and space it out. If you do that, you can get a longer uh, period of time between cleanings. Uh, if you're going to, you're going to, you know, you're going to use that water. It's, we're heavy water users. It's the way it is. I, it's not going to change, and you want to clean your tank a little bit more often, and that um, that'll just keep 
you from getting too overloaded with solids. It'll it'll we'll be cleaning a little bit ahead of schedule, um, but because you're heavy using a lot of water, um, it's going to be protecting the drain field, and that's ultimately our goal. That's why we clean the tanks is to uh, prevent uh, solid buildup from getting to a point where it becomes easily uh, pushed out to the drain field, and and that's. Uh, one of the, the biggest factors of uh, failure in, in the drain field is um, uh, not maintaining the tanks and allowing those solids to continue to get pushed out to the drain field and, uh, and that certainly shortens the life of the system. So, but uh, we'll, uh, I'll put together a little chart too. Uh, we've got a, we've got a, a chart of the average um, cleaning periods uh, for uh, for our drivers, so if they, if if we can't, we don't have all the information. We can at least give a good suggestion uh, for where the homeowner wants to be going forward. So that's uh, that's all the that's all the questions I have for today. Um, I would I would love to hear your comments. I would love your feedback. Um, I want I want this program to help you as a homeowner. Um, I want it to be informative for you. I want it to be. Uh, I want it to provide as much value as I can. Um, so, uh, please send in your questions. Um, send in the you know whatever it is that that, that came up in your head. I, I wonder how that works, or I wonder why they do that, or you know I I had someone come out and pump my tank and they did this. Is that right, or why did they do that, or you know. We this this is just this is education, and we believe very very strongly in, in educating our customers. Um, the more you know, the better you'll take care of your system. The better you take care of your system, uh, it sure makes life a lot easier on on us contractors when we come out uh, to do your tank cleanings. So um, get those questions in. Um, we would love to to answer them, and uh, we will. Uh, uh, see you on the next one, and I really, really, really appreciate you uh, tuning here, tuning in here on our first episode. Um, and uh, like I said, I hope it uh, answered some questions, and uh, we'll keep answering them. So we'll see you on the next one. Thanks a lot.